Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, after a short delay, we can go back to our lecture and we will talk about interventional medical image processing. Today we want to discuss 3D ultrasound and in particular the application how to reconstruct 3D volumes from 2D ultrasound slices. Okay, we will first uh, have a couple of historical remarks on the history of uh, ultrasound, then a couple of facts on ultrasound, a bit of the physics. Uh, remember that these things won't be relevant for the, uh, won't be relevant for the um, written exam, but rather the factorization methods that we will focus on in the, in the second part of the lecture. Um, so we will then describe factorization methods, and factorization methods we will find extremely useful because with uh, those kind of methods we will be able to reconstruct um, a set of 3D positions while also reconstructing the camera poses without any additional input. So this is a really nice algorithm, and you will find it extremely useful. It's also very popular. It's also been cited a lot of times in literature. Good. So, a couple of historical remarks. So, actually, um, medical ultrasound was discovered in uh, 1942, and uh, it was the first time actually used for, for medical purposes. But uh, the, the entire theory and um, uh, first applications actually come from a military background. Yeah? You will see that uh, this technolo uh, technology was found to be extremely useful if you want to detect submarines. So this is where many of the basics come from. And again, you can see that a lot of technology is useful in a medical sense. You, you can use it to help people, but on the other hand, a very similar kind of technology can also be used in military applications. So you can always uh, think about that when you're actually driving science, that you should also uh, think about ethics and the actual application of your science. Then in 1984, the first 3D ultrasound system was reported um, by Baba. And uh, here you can actually see that the very first applications also go back to a cometry uh, by Aristoteles. So it has a long history. Very well. So what we are actually interested in is propagation of waves and measurement of reflectance. In order to do that, we are generating pressure waves, and they are generated by um, periodic motion. And this way, we are able to send out waves uh, along into a medium. There's a couple of things that happen with those waves. So first of all, uh, they can be reflected. So if the boundary between two media um, is in a certain condition, you will realize that the wave will be reflected and they will not be transmitted. Then there's the effect of um, refraction. This can also happen that your waves are bended and uh, you can experience absorption. And absorption will be that if you have um, acoustic energy uh, that will be absorbed by the tissue and then it will attenuate the wave. So the wave will get weaker the further it propagates into tissue. And in between, every time you have an intersection between media, uh, it can be either uh, reflected or refracted. Down here you see a couple of uh, ultrasound machines, and you can notice that uh, ultrasound is a modality where you, if you have a look at the user interface, you will see that it, is, uh, it seems rather complicated but people are really well used to it and they can operate these systems very well and securely. And here you can also see another a, a more newer device of an ultrasound system here to the right hand side. Uh, actually, there has been further developments in ultrasound and nowadays you can even produce uh, ultrasound uh, sensors and also ultrasound displays that are handheld. So you can actually use ultrasound uh, in, for example, in an ambulance. So this is also a nice thing about ultrasound. It's the, the, the technology is very, very well available. So you have ultrasound in many clinics, many doctors use it, 
and uh, it's, it's a rather cheap technology compared to the other modalities that we've seen in the lecture so far. So an ultrasound device is much cheaper than a CT system and it's also much cheaper than an MR system. So MR is really, really expensive. And in 2D ultrasound, uh, you can deploy it even in an ambulance. These are a couple of images. And um, of course, everybody knows uh, ultrasound from fetal imaging. And another reason, of course, why ultrasound is very popular is it's not using any, ion, um, any ionizing radiation. So you're merely using um, acoustic properties, reflection of sound waves and uh, they are not ionizing the tissue. Yeah? So you don't have any radiation exposure, and this is also why it's very popular in fetal imaging, so that you can create images uh, of, the, um, of the growing fetus, and you can also measure different functional elements. For example, you can also measure blood flow within the heart of the fetus, so you can actually uh, check whether all the heart chambers are correctly functioning and whether the blood flow is uh, correct. Another application is 3D ultrasound and with 3D ultrasound, so what you've previously seen is always 2D ultrasound images. So you have uh, either a static 2D image or a motion mode where you have several, a sequence of 2D images that you can see with 20 frames per second. So you can really see motion in those 2D images. But you can also rearrange, you can acquire a total fan of 2D images. And if you do so, you can acquire a 3D volume. And now a 3D volume is very nice because in a 3D volume, you can also do metric measurements. Imagine you, typically you have only 2D uh, images in ultrasound and now you want to measure something inside the body. And uh, depending on the slice that you're selecting, you're always generating slices. Huh? And imagine that you're looking at a, specific, um, at a specific bone and then you're missing a part. So let's say only this part of the bone is within your slice and you measure from this point to this point and then it disappears. But you were actually interested in the entire bone and there's a slight curvature. It's really difficult to measure the, exact, uh, the entire bone because it may move out of the slice. Uh, and if you do 3D, then you can acquire the full volume and then you can also realize effects like that something has left the volume. And of course, a very nice application is again fetal imaging and you can actually visualize the face uh, of an unborn child. So you can, the first time you can see uh, your kid nowadays is not uh, after birth, but you can also have a look at the face of your uh, future child already during pregnancy. Another application is um, measurement, so also very relevant, but not as exciting images as these, of course, in particular when you're going to become uh, parents very soon. Uh, but also very useful is, for example, flow measurements in the, in the carotid artery. And here you can uh, see if there's something wrong with the flow or if there's a narrowing in your carotid artery that is supplying the brain. And this is also very important uh, for stroke uh, prevention. So a very common cause for stroke is that you have a, a narrowing, a stenosis in your carotid artery. And at some point, the um, stenosis is actually plaque that is on the wall of the carotid artery. And at some point, the plaque breaks open and there's a whole clot of blood going up into your brain and then you suffer from a stroke. So with this, you can actually monitor and uh, try to do preventive measures if you have a narrowing of your carotid artery. So for example, you could put in a very tiny mesh that uh, holds back the plaque and fixes it within the artery such that you uh, don't suffer from stroke. And on the right-hand side, uh, you also see a 3D, vessel of, uh, a 3D visualization of the flow of vessels. Good, some facts. So, in general, physical media can vibrate and produce sound. And here the sound uh, equals to tissue vibrations. And we are essentially sending sine waves. And the peak uh, presents the maximum. And uh, of course, they have also a minimum pressure along your wave. And you can now characterize different sound waves with the period or the frequency, speed, amplitude, 
power intensity and wavelength. And we will see shortly how those things are related to each other. Typically, you have um, a propagation speed, and this uh, propagation speed in human tissue is about 1,500 meters per second. So these sound waves travel pretty fast. In contrast um, to hearable sound, which is between 20 and 20,000 hertz, uh, if you may remember the CD, who, who has owned a, a CD player? Do you still remember the CD? Yeah, yeah. Who of you, all of you remember the CD? Yeah. I, I recently taught a first semester class and nobody was really sure what a CD is. They just have MP3 players now. Yeah. Maybe they, they no. Anyway, so if you remember the CD, uh, it typically had a sampling rate uh, between 8 and 44 kilohertz. And the 44 kilohertz sampling rate is, of course, uh, decided by the hearable spectrum. So you're sampling at a higher frequency than the, uh, than the frequencies than your ear can resolve, and then you make sure that all of these frequencies are covered. Um, anyway, it won't be relevant for your exam, so you don't have to memorize it. It's just, um, um, yeah, maybe if you still know the uh, CD, then you can also easily derive what human hearing is able to do. You just cut by two, and then you know that the, the 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate of the CD are designed in, that, in such a way that is uh, exactly the Nyquist frequency of human hearing. Very well. Uh, in clinical ultrasound, we have uh, 1 to 10 megahertz, so it's a much higher frequency, so we won't be actually hearing anything if somebody is undergoing an ultrasound uh, diagnosis. So you can't perceive this with your ear. Okay, <clears throat> just um, a couple of numbers. Um, the sound, uh, the speed of um, the wave speed or the speed of propagation is given here, and here you have it for different media. And you can see that the speed of propagation is very different in air. So you have a sound speed of about 331 meters per second. Yeah, this would be one Mach, right? And uh, in bones, you have uh, bones are very dense, and in bones you have a much higher propagation speed. So within bones, you would have 3,600 meters per second that uh, the waves actually propagate at. The interesting thing is now that uh, grease, uh, water, brain tissue, muscles, they are all more or less in the ballpark uh, of 1,500 meters per second. And you can also see that the um, acoustic impedance that is given here is also in a very similar range. In air, you have a much uh, lower acoustic impedance, and in bone, it's uh, considerably higher. And here you can see the density of these tissues. And you, of course, air is not very dense, and uh, bone is the densest material that you can observe in this table. And again, all the other tissues that typically appear inside the body um, are of the density of approximately water. And now you can already imagine um, we are well, we will see that on the next slide, but we will see that uh, the interfaces in grease, water, brain tissue, and muscles can be very well handled by ultrasound. But as soon as you have something in the way that is either air or bones, your signal will get stuck because you will um, get a total reflection. We see that in a couple of slides. So, but you can remember that the uh, medium actually determines the velocity, the velocity of sound and that um, sound of different frequencies propagates at the same speed in the same medium. Okay, so we can hear also, actually we've seen the acoustic impedance before, but uh, you can easily check if the previous table is correct because you just take the density times uh, the speed of sound waves and you should get your Z, the acoustic impedance. So it's just a multiplication of those two um, variables. Now, the interesting part is the reflectance. So now you're sending waves inside into the tissue, and you have some uh, interface between two different tissues. And we have one that is the incoming wave, that is the wave that we are sending into the tissue, and then we have the reflected wave. And of course, this wave also has an intensity. And now we can only, by the acoustic impedance of the two materials, we can 
determine how much of the intensity is going to be reflected and how much um, is going to be, uh, yeah, how much of this intensity is going to be reflected. And you can see now uh, if you have uh, Z2 and Z1, if they're in the same in the same ballpark, if they have the same number, um, then you will get something that will be very close. So if they're in the same number, this will equal to 1. So this will cancel out. So we will get 0 up here. And if you have uh, something, and you will get a factor of about 2 here. So if you have two um, values that are in the same ballpark, this will cancel out. And the reflected amount of intensity will be approximately 0. Now, if you have a very strong difference between the two, you will see that this will become a very high value. And if this is um, a very high value, and this is going to be a very high value, then we will get something that will be close to 1, and you will get uh, almost a total reflection. So if you have a high difference in Z, and if uh, you remember between air and bone, that was factors of 4 or something, or uh, in air it's even worse, so there were um, even a couple of powers of 10 difference. And uh, this essentially means that you have a total reflection at the interface. Now, all of you have already seen, I, I suspect all of you have already seen an, an ultrasound examination. And typically, you use some kind of uh, almost liquid medium in between the head of the probe and uh, in between the tissue that you want to image. And this is exactly because of this effect. If there were any air in between, you would get a total reflection and your signal would entirely cancel out. So this is why you have this lubricant uh, that is attached to the head of the probe, such that you get um, a watery kind of medium in between that you don't suffer from total reflectance. And you can immediately uh, derive it here from this equation why this is the fact. So this is a very interesting observation. And now we can use that to actually image. So we send out waves into the tissue. And of course, uh, not, all of the, uh, not, not all of the wave is going to be reflected at once. So what will happen is you could send a direct pulse along a, uh, a ray into the medium. And then you will have reflectance at certain points. And the signal will be reflected back to the uh, to the transducer. So you have some, some ultrasound probe that is able to send signals, but also to receive it. So you will have a transducer. And this transducer will send out uh, just a single wave. And then it will measure all the reflectance that came back from the tissue. And by the delay in time, you know at, at what depth this uh, kind of reflection was. They're approximately all the same speed. And this way, you can actually figure out at what depth you have different tissue intersections. And this way, you are able to resolve a long array, along your wave. Uh, you will be able to resolve the different tissues that occur on this ray. Then, of course, uh, the quantities, uh, frequency, wavelength, and uh, the velocity are related to each other. So if you have fixed your medium, you can derive the wavelength from the frequency or the other way around. Now, let's say you have a, a change of median in between, then, of course, um, your C will change. So if you have the, a signal of, the, of a certain wavelength and you um, it suddenly have a change of medium, then uh, your sound propagation will also change. Generally, sound propagates faster through uh, tissues with higher density. So sound propagates faster through, through bones than liquids. And, yeah. Yeah. and for example, for echocardiographic imaging, um, you will have a higher image resolution uh, to, because you will have a smaller wavelength. Yeah. So uh, imagine that you, uh, you have some the higher the frequency, the lower the wavelength, of course. And uh, you can also see that if you, have, uh, if you have shorter wavelengths, then you will be able, um, 
let me think, if you have a short wavelength, then you will be able to, re uh, to have a very fine resolution. Because imagine you, you, will, be, uh, you will be measuring a reflection, yeah? and you're sending out a wave. So let's say this is your wave that you're sending out, and you have your, your head of your probe here, and then you have uh, two different uh, boundaries. And now if you send out a wave of this length, this length, it will be, the wavelength is short enough to actually differentiate the two. But if I were to differentiate two boundaries at this point, I need a very short wavelength. Yeah? So the shorter the wavelength, uh, the higher the resolution that I can get in such a system. But on the other hand, the shorter the wavelength, uh, the higher the absorption. Shorter waves will be absorbed with a, with a, higher, uh, so a, a higher amount of energy will be absorbed at a short wavelength, which means that your penetration into the tissue will be lower. So if you have a long wavelength, then you will propagate deeper into the tissue, but you will get a worse resolution because you cannot differentiate two boundaries that are close to each other. So this is the, uh, the reason why you change uh, the wavelength for imaging and you uh, specifically pick the wavelength for specific applications. Yeah? So you have to know what you want to be able to resolve, then you design the wavelength, and this will also then uh, determine how far into the tissue it can actually penetrate. And of course, if there's bone on the way, uh, you will have a much higher reflectance. So typically, if you do uh, imaging through the torso, you have to be very careful with your ultrasound probe because you have to find a location where you can look through the ribs. Yeah? And this also requires some skill. So generally, for ultrasound imaging, um, you need people who are used to the, modality, uh, to the modality and know the specific problems that occur. And you need a certain amount of skill to be, image around, uh, to be able to image around the bone and so on. So this is often the reason, and of course because your, uh, your planes can be slant, and this is often the reason why people call uh, the modality of ultrasound observer dependent, because it really uh, depends on the skill. And if you have a very good skill, you can do very highly reproducible measures. But if you're an inexperienced user, you will select very different uh, slices, which will then result in very noisy in measurements with very, very high variance. Okay. Um, then you can also determine uh, the distance between the source and the boundary. And this is, of course, uh, the speed of, uh, of sound times the time that has passed until the signal was recovered, and then you divide by two because the signal has to go into the tissue and come back. Uh, this is how you can actually reconstruct the depth. This is the distance. Okay, let's have a look at the application of 3D ultrasound. And now the big advantage of 3D ultrasound is that you get an entire 3D image. And with this 3D image, you can then re-slice it again. So you can generate uh, arbitrary slice images from this 3D volume again. And this way, you can start segmenting structures in 3D. And ho hopefully, you have some semi-automatic or fully automatic segmentation algorithm. And that will uh, produce reproducible results or more reproducible results if you have inexperienced users. If you have very experienced users, they might be able to get a very well the same slices that you need for measuring certain orientations or for measuring certain lengths. So in particular, um, the length of specific bones in, uh, in children uh, or in, in fetuses are interesting for the development of the child and they use that as predictors uh, in order to determine whether the development of your child inside the mother's uh, body is really on track or if there's something delayed. But then again, they do something like 25 measurements and every time you go and see the doctors, you get uh, 25 measurements and for everything you get a standard deviation and the mean value. And then if you're off by one of the measurements, uh, all of the parents get crazy and say, oh my God, there's something wrong with my child. And <laughs> so, yeah. 
this is also a hard time when you see, oh my God, there could be something off. But in most of the case, cases, everything is going to be all right. So anyway, <laughs> parents can get really worried. <laughs> Good. Very well. So the idea for 3D ultrasound is very similar to what we, what we did in, in 2D ultrasound. And now we just want to have many slices and want to rearrange them through a volume. So for example, you could have a transducer and then move it at a fixed speed, have a fixed frame rate, and then you get uh, this kind of slice images and you can realign them to a 3D volume. So this would be the ideal world. And you have some operator there, and he's able to constantly move in the same speed, and you get exactly your 3D volume. So no big deal. But typically, um, well, there's actually solutions to that, uh, and people have been building such systems. So for example, this uh, very uh, handy device here you can put in an ultrasound probe head and then it will move the probe with a fixed speed and so you are able to actually sample a 3D volume. And then you can actually visualize uh, um, a carotis bifurcation here and use it uh, to prepare your intervention. Another approach is uh, that you could also, instead of moving, if, instead of doing a translational motion, um, you've, you've seen this device is, is kind of bulky, but it will be able to do a reproducible motion. So instead, you could also take an ultrasound probe and twist it. So you turn it at a fixed speed, and then you will also be able to sample a 3D volume. So if you do that, there's a couple of options. So for example, you could rotate. So if you rotate the head of the probe, then you will acquire such a volume. You can just tilt it then you will be acquiring such a volume. And the first device that we've already seen would be a um, translational motion, and we would acquire such a volume. And if we do that mechanically with a device, we can even get these samplings automatically. So these are a couple of devices um, that actually implement such motions. So here you can see something that has a rotating head. and. Um, here you can see some translational stages that actually implement such kind of motion. An entirely different approach is you just use the system as it's now being used. So you do this manually. So you take the ultrasound probe and you just move it across the patient. But if you do that manually, what you will see is, well, this stage is still the same. So you get a set of slice images. Uh, but in fact, you need to be able to resample them to get your 3D volume. So you need some kind of tracking in order to follow the ultrasound head. And this is where our camera calibration comes in. So this is where we use some kind of marker system. And here we have a marker that we could attach to our probe. And then we could take, a, for example, a stereo camera system and try to track the markers here. And once we track the markers and they're synchronized with the ultrasound system, we will know how these slices are oriented with respect to each other. And then we can resample the volume such that we get a true 3D volume. Now the workflow um, would be, oh yes, uh, the workflow in a um, cardiac scene could be like this. So you typically have a very quick motion of the heart. And what you can do in order to compensate the motion of the heart is you can simultaneously acquire the ECG signal. So the ECG signal, you probably all of you have already seen this kind of waveform here, and it will be synchronized with the heartbeat. So what you can do now is, well, one slice view you can take in no time. So you can create continuous uh, 2D uh, motions, 2D planar views, 2D slice images of the heart. But as soon as you want to go to 3D, you have the motion of the ultrasound head. Even if you have mechanical motion like here, uh, then you will image different slices at different, uh, at different acquisition times. So they will belong to a different heart state. And what you can do now is, since you have a synchronous ECG, you can order those slices into 
uh, in, into relative time. So you say the beginning of the ECG signal is 0% and the end here is 100%. And then you order them from 0 to 100% and you build stacks of slices. And then you can virtually freeze a 3D image of the heart and you can also create a 3D movie then by playing back the different uh, stacks at the same time. So you assume that the ECG on your heart is beating in a periodic way and every time it's doing the same motion. So if I take this slice and the next, uh, the neighboring slice in the next repetition in the next period of the signal, then I will uh, assume that I still get a valid matching correspondence. So what I'm doing is I'm imaging several heart cycles and then rearrange my slices such that they match into the same bin. They match into the same time bin. And this way I can create a one cycle, one heart cycle, that is acquired entirely in 3D and I can get even the entire motion. But remember, in order to use this ECG triggering, you will really need a periodic motion. But here, a couple of cycles will already be enough. So we assume that over, let's say, uh, four cycles, our heart will be more or less periodic so that we can rearrange that. One drawback of this method is, of course, most of the time when you want to image the heart and you want to compensate for the heartbeat, the patient has some problem with the heart. And there is a certain likelihood associated that uh, the periodicity assumption will no longer hold. Uh, then you will get artifacts uh, because the ECG is no longer a very good predictor of the motion or the, simply the heart motion is not that periodic and every period is different from the previous one. And then you will get artifact. By the way, um, how, do you get, how do you get your ultrasound probe into this position? Can you imagine how you get there? You open the torso and then you put in a wire. Yeah, it's a, it's a catheter. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, tube that you put in, and can you, can you identify this structure here? What do you think, what uh, anatomic structure this is? Yeah? Yeah, exactly, you put it into the mouth and you head down the esophagus. Yeah? So you go down the Speiseröhre. Yeah? Don't, don't go, go down the air tube. Yeah? This is not, not a good idea. Go down the esophagus, otherwise you... It might fix the issue with the beating heart if you do that. Um, anyway, good. Um, so this is a nice visualization of how you can do ECG triggering. Then, of course, one thing that you have to do is... Um, now, imagine you have sampled the slices the way as you see them down here you don't get them in a Cartesian grid as you would like to present the volumetric image. So what you need to do is, uh, you will have to resample, so you have to interpolate. And of course, there's a couple of techniques that you can apply for interpolation. And um, something uh, that is very, very quick is uh, voxel nearest neighbor. So you just determine the nearest voxel to every point, and then you assign the, the intensity to of the closest nearest neighbor to that specific voxel. And then, of course, you can do stuff like distance-weighted interpolation, which will, give you, um, which will give you nicer intensities, but at the same time, you will uh, suffer from a slight blurring if you start doing that. So all of these interpolation techniques will return into a, a different image character, and um, yeah, typically uh, you decide for... Uh, typically, people uh, try to use distant-weighted interpolation, but also with nearest neighbor interpolation, you can already get uh, results rather quickly. Good. Now that we have talked so much about 3D ultrasound, let's talk a bit how about we can actually reconstruct the 3D position of such an uh, ultrasound probe. And we will look into the method of factorization. And this is a very, very nice algorithm. You, I hope everybody will love this algorithm after this lecture. It's very nice. I really like it. So the idea is um, that we want to reconstruct 
the point positions, the 3D positions of all the points that we have observed. And at the same time, we want to reconstruct the camera pose. So this sounds like a, like a miracle, right? Now we did all this stuff with camera calibration and so on, and now um, I'm telling you that you can reconstruct the 3D points and the camera poses at the same time. Well, of course, there is a, a couple of, of um, compromises that we are doing so far. So first of all, if we want to apply this method, you need to have at least three images, three or more images of your scene. And in all of these three images, you have to have tracked the markers. Yeah? So you will only be able to apply this method if you were able to track all of the points in all of your images. So there's a couple of assumptions that we have to do. And one of the biggest um, assumptions that we're doing here is that we have an orthogonal projection model. And you will see that the orthogonal projection will simplify everything quite a bit. Uh, but we can also extend this to perspective projection, but then we have to use a couple of more tricks. Yes? It's, it's just a number of tracked points. So you need, but the tracked points have to be the same in, in every point. So typically you use markers as the one you've seen previously on the slide. So you have to have points that you can track really well because if you start confusing points in the tracking, uh, all of your reconstruction will go wrong. And another po uh, point is the world points are not coplanar. So you need something that is really a 3D point cloud. If they are all in one plane, you won't be able to use this algorithm. Now in the following, we will, rotate, uh, we will reconstruct points, uh, pj, and we will, uh, of course, use uh, homogeneous coordinates here. And these world points, they need to be uh, visible in all frames, and we will index them with uh, uh, in the projection, we will index them with x, i, j, and y, i, j. Yeah? So we have a 2D projection, and the point j in frame i will be indexed with i, j. So j, j point in the i frame. Okay. Now, the idea is something that we first have to explain. Because the idea that we want to follow is we all the measurement observations, all the 2D points that we have observed, we just put them into a big matrix, and then what we want to do is we want to factorize the matrix M into two products, into two matrices, and the matrix product of R and S will then be M again. So this is the general idea that we want to follow, and we will magically try to find the two matrices R and S, and now R and S have a very nice property because R is going to be a matrix describing only the projection matrices. It will only describe properties of your, of your camera position, it, essentially the extrinsic parameters of your, uh, of your projection model. And S will be a matrix that contains the structure. So S contains all of your world points. That is the general idea that we want to follow. Now that sounds cool, right? I just take some nice matrix and then I factorize it. And from the factorization, we get suddenly all of the projection parameters and all of our world points. Isn't that great? Well, and if we go down to orthogonal, to the orthogonal case, we can even simplify this problem further because uh, we don't need the homogeneous coordinates here. You remember that for the orthogonal case, we didn't have to introduce homogeneous coordinates. So we can simplify our problem further. Uh, so R will be only a uh, two times the number of frames times three matrix. And every, every line in R will essentially describe the base vectors uh, spanning the image plane. So if you, you can define the image plane by two orthogonal vectors, and those two vectors will describe the image plane. And uh, of course, in 3D, you only need uh, three elements for describing a vector. 
So these two vectors will describe the image plane, and then you have S, and S is a three times number of points matrix, because uh, every point in 3D is also just a, a set of three indices or three coordinates. Good. And then I multiply those two with each other, and I will get a matrix M. And of course, the matrix M has two times the number of frames uh, times number of points elements. Uh, once, once I multiply the two here, uh, I will get a matrix of this size. Good. Then let's think about that. Can we find something like this? This sounds very interesting. And we will actually show that we can uh, very nicely uh, find a solution for this in the orthogonal case. Now, the idea is that our measurement matrix M, we will construct it in a way that I put all of the X coordinates in the projection into a matrix and all of the Y coordinates um, into a matrix. So I will have all of the X coordinates up to the number of points he in here, and I will have um, uh, in for one frame, and for the next frame, I will put it in the next row until the number of frames. So what I put in my matrix is uh, number of frames times, times number of points X coordinates and number of frames times number of points Y coordinates, which will give us a matrix that will be two times the number of frames times the number of points. Okay, so I just put all the coordinates that I observed on my screen, on my projection, and I just put them into a big matrix. Now, I actually uh, have to apply a small trick, and we will uh, do the following trick. We will define the center of our, the centroid of our point cloud. We will define it as the origin. So we'll now use the trick that we move the origin into the centroid of our points, and we do the same in our projection. And I can easily move my projection into the center of gravity of my points by just subtracting the mean values. So what I do in every projection is I take the mean over all the x values, and I take the mean over all the y values per frame and subtract it. And this will result in a coordinate system that will be centered in the center of mass of the projection of the points. Okay, so this is then called the registered measurement matrix. Simply subtract the mean of the X and the mean of Y for the respective frame and subtract it. Good, and of course you should be able to compute mean values, um, which is just given down here. Good. Once I did that, I can now describe the, so here you have, let's say we have some, uh, some, arbitrary, um, some arbitrary coordinate system, then our imaging plane will be spanned by the vectors uh, V and U. These are, these are the vectors V and U, and they will sp span the projection plane, and then I can project my point orthogonally onto this plane, and I will get this observation on my screen. And this is some world coordinate system that um, describes the, uh, the center of our world system. And generally, our projection here uh, is shifted with respect to some kind of uh, translation vector. Uh, so this, in the general case, this uh, center here and this center here do not coincide uh, before I do the registration. So this is the case where I don't have the registered coordinates. And generally, those two origins will be different by a translational vector. And what I will show in the following is that if we use this trick of registering our world coordinate system, and our projection coordinate system onto the centroid of points, uh, actually this translation vector will cancel out. So if we use this trick of the registered, um, of the registered coordinates, of the registered matrix, then we will actually show that we no longer, we get independent of this translation vector T. Uh, that is the connection between the origin of the image plane and the world coordinate. So you can generally describe 
the projection. Generally, you can describe the projection of a world point onto this image plane by taking the world point, then you shift by t, which is the center of your, which is the center of your uh, camera. Uh, this is the, the translation vector to your camera position. And then you multiply with u to get x, and you multiply with v, which is the uh, which is the other direction of the image plane, and you get y. So this is just an inner product of here. This is generally the way of how you can uh, compute the x and the y coordinates here. And now we will show that we can actually get rid of this translation vector ti uh, if we actually use this trick that we center our world coordinate system also into the centroid of the points. So this means that if we take the, um, if we take the average or if we compute the center of mass of our 3D points, we will get the zero vector. So this is a vector with only three zeros. Nice. So if we do that, we can easily show that if we have a, a registered point, this is now the Regi regi registered point. This is the original observation, and we subtract the mean value. So this is what we put earlier. And if we do that, we can replace this, of course, with the respective projections of the non-registered registered case, where we have our vector u multiplied with the world point, shifted by the translation. And of course, we can do the same for our mean value, and our mean value is just the sum over all points divided by the number of points where we do exactly the same projection. Now, if we do that, you can actually see that your translation vector i, because this is a sum over m, this is independent of i, so you can actually pull this out and um, also normalize it with 1 over uh, np. So you see that this translation vector goes out of here. And you can also split the product up here into uh, u times p and u times t. Now, if you do that, what do we observe here? Do you recognize this? This is just the centroid. And, and we just defined the centroid to be zero. So this guy here cancels out. Then we have u, uh, u transpose times the zero vector, which will also be zero. And all that remains is minus u transpose minus t multiplied. So the sign will flip, and we get plus u transpose t. And here we have minus u transpose t. So all that remains is u transpose p. So we can see that the projection in the registered case is simply the base vector of our projection times the world point. Okay, And exactly the same also holds for y. So we can put up the same system of equations for y, which now allows us to rewrite our entire measurement matrix. So we registered them, and we now know that at every point, at every um, ij, xij and yij, we can simply replace it with u transpose p1. So this is u1. Uh, P1, U, U1, P2, U1, P, and P. And we just have, so we always have the same uh, projection vector here and also the same projection vector here. And we always have the same point in the same column. Yeah? And this is a very nice observation because now at every entry in the matrix, we have simply a scalar product. It's an inner product of the uh, of the vector describing the projection and the world point. And now we can factorize it. So we can actually show that there must be a factorization that contains only the vectors u and v that describe our two projection parameters and that there will be another matrix containing only the world points. So there, we just showed there exists a factorization of this simple measurement matrix that we just set up by um, subtracting the mean and put it into a big matrix. And we just showed there must be 
a factorization into two matrices where one matrix just describes the projection parameters and the other matrix just describes the points. Now, isn't that cool? Now, we have to find a way how to actually decompose this into two matrices. So, well, there's actually plenty of ways to decompose matrices, and one, our favorite method of decomposing matrices is, of course, SVD. So, we can now use SVD and uh, factorize our matrix into three matrices. Now, we actually wanted to have only two matrices, and now we have three matrices. So, one thing that you will also realize is, uh, well, there's actually an infinite solutions for the factorizing matrices. Imagine just factorizing a simple number, like the number six. You can factorize it to two and three, but to one and six. So there's already an infinite number of factorizations uh, for just factorizing uh, simple numbers. So it's not unique. You will find uh, plenty of solutions for that. And the same holds, of course, for the factorization of matrices. And in the general case, you can always uh, find a factorization R and Q. And by simply, so you take R and you uh, take S. And now we can always find a matrix Q that is invertible. And I put it in here. And I find a matrix here that I can call R hat. And I can find a matrix that I will call S hat. So there's, uh, there's, as many solutions as I can find in vertebral matrices. Okay. So, so nice algorithm, such a nice algorithm, and now this, this, there's no unique solution. Too bad. So, what do we do? Do we give up? No, we don't give up. No, we don't give up. Of course, we will need to find a trick how to get rid of this problem. Okay. Well, um, what can we do about that? Well, the thing is, uh, we know a couple of additional things. And to be honest, uh, we know that we have, in particular, the geometry of our image plane is not arbitrary. Because we know that um, our two vectors, they need to be orthogonal. So the scalar product between the respective u and v needs to be zero. They are orthogonal. And we also can help us a bit by defining that the length of the two projection vectors describing our, our projection plane, that they are unit vectors. So if we do that, then we can suddenly help us in finding Q. And the thing is, we use our favorite tool, SVD, to find a first solution for, uh, for R and S. And then we try to find the matrix Q that exactly matches to our problem. And we will try to optimize Q, or we try to find Q in such a way that we exactly fulfill those constraints here. Yeah. And the constraints is that U and V are orthogonal and their unit length. And if we do that, um, we can actually start by the initialization. And this is then already Tomasi's famous factorization algorithm, where we track points. We need the correspondences between all the points. And then we can determine our registered measurement matrix, where we subtract the means. And then we simply do SVD on this matrix. We can check, uh, we can check if the factorization makes sense, because actually our rank needs to be 3. You remember that because we have 3D points, and we are multiplying two matrices at this uh, boundary. So the rank of the matrix, the registered measurement matrix, needs to be 3. And, uh, for example, we can enforce that by setting all the singular values that are higher than, uh, uh, that are higher or equal to 4 to 0, because then we will only get a rank 3. Now we can take the two submatrices, um, u prime and v prime of u, that exactly match those um, highest singular values. And uh, then we can actually compose our r hat by u prime uh, sigma prime uh, square root. How, how do I do the square root of a matrix? 
it's a diagonal matrix. Yeah? All the elements uh, are on the diagonal, so it's simply the square root of the diagonal elements. Yeah? So this is how I can compute the square root of this particular matrix because it's just a diagonal matrix. So I multiply u prime uh, with sigma prime square root and sigma prime square root with v uh, prime transpose, and these are my initial estimates for r and s. And in the next step, I have to solve a, a non-linear optimization problem, and I will try to find Q such that the uh, such that my Q enforces U to be of unit length. And remember, now we are only regarding R. Huh? Now we are only we are only enforcing this on R. We don't need anything about S here. All that we need to know is Q, in the end, Q needs to be invertible. But we can find then the elements of Q such that all of our UI have unit length, all of our VI have unit length. So this is nothing else than, than the two norm here uh, of, of V transpose Q. Yeah? This is nothing else than the two norm uh, of this and this. And then, of course, after applying Q, our two vectors have to be orthogonal. And this is why we end up with a transpose here. Yeah? Note this, this is not a matrix inverse. If this were a matrix inverse, these constraints wouldn't make any sense. This is just a transpose. And of course, Q uh, doesn't, it doesn't, is not a rotation matrix. If Q were a rotation matrix, then it would also cancel out. Q is um, not a rotation matrix because it must also be able to enforce this criterion of two vectors that are not orthogonal to actually make them orthogonal. Sometimes uh, people confuse that. Yeah? Just keep that in the back of your mind. And then you need to find this matrix Q, and this matrix Q you compute the inverse, and from the inverse you can compute S, the structure, or the points locations, and from R hat you can compute R, where you have all your camera parameters in there, all the vectors. Isn't that awesome? We can reconstruct 3D points, camera poses, everything just from tracking a number of points. It sounds a bit like bootstrapping, like, like the Baron Münchhausen who pulls himself uh, out of any problem. Uh, but you can actually do that. And uh, of course, keep in mind, uh, this is true for an uh, orthogonal case. And another thing um, that we need to remark is the points that we are reconstructing, we are reconstructing everything up to scale. So just from a series of projections, you will never figure out how big the object actually is because this depends on, on the, your field of view, so you will never be able to reconstruct any metric information from this. So. Um, also, the nonlinear optimization is not very pleasant, so you have to be, uh, you have to think about that a bit, how to do this efficiently and uh, try to solve that uh, efficiently. The method is, uh, you could say, democratic, so all points are treated equally. So if you have an outlier in there, uh, it, it can destroy your your points a bit. So you can also. Uh, expand this uh, to also introduce confidence about your tracking results. Mathematically, it's very simple and it's stable because we're using SVD. Um, one thing is it only yields the rotation of the world points. Uh, so you, you, we just shown that we got rid of the translation, so we only do a reconstruction with respect to um, rotation, but not translation because we have um, uh, orthogonal system. This is also used in industry, so this is actually um, some algorithm that has that is actually used in products. Then, um, yeah, the translation parallel to the image plane is proportional to the translation of the image centroid between two frames. This is also clear. Um, and in fact, you can also add new frames, and if you add new frames, you will even get a more stable solution. One problem that you have to get uh, to cope with is that you have to re you have to have all 3D points visible in all frames. So if you start with occlusion, so let's say you're tracking some object 
and you're looking on this side, tracking points on this side, and then you move over to here, then you suddenly use the correspondence on this side because you, your view is blocked. So there is extensions how to actually handle occlusions in here. But uh, in the version that we discuss here, we don't discuss the uh, occlusion problem and that you may lose points in the tracking just because of how the object or things are shaped. Yeah. And, yeah, and of course, uh, you need to have an orthogonal image in your camera. Yes? Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not discussing it here. So you have to set up the a constraint minimization problem here and the objective function. Yeah. With respect to the elements of Q. And then you realize uh, in these constraints uh, you have the quadratic elements here. Hmm? Uh, you need to set up an, an objective function such that it punishes deviation from from these uh, uh, from these constraints. Mario, good. Um, then we can also expand this algorithm and remember. So the the orthogonal case is something that let's say would be quite well suited uh, for something like an exam. So this I would consider rather important, uh, but actually the perspective case is something for your interest and to show you that we can actually expand this also to a perspective case. Because most of the time you don't have uh, orthogonal projections and the orthographic uh, projection will, will simply fail. So you can do that and it has been published by Sturm in uh, 1996. And it's very similar to the orthographic factorization, but it's iterative. And the main idea is um, that you have to estimate something which is called um, a projective depth, which we will introduce shortly. Again, the preliminaries are very similar to what we had before. We again need three frames, but now we are working with homogeneous coordinates and, uh, of course, with projection matrices. Again, the points need to be not coplanar uh, co and uh, we now work with homogeneous coordinates also in the projection. And we use the scaling factor lambda here that we call a projective depth. And this depth then allows us to keep uh, track of the different uh, distance of the points uh, to, the, to the camera center. Now what we do is um, we set up our, uh, our projection equation here and we know that the world point will be projected with a projection matrix. And in homogeneous coordinates, in principle, there is some lambda. And this lambda um, is non-zero, but uh, we can have different scalings here. And this will correlate actually to the depth. Yeah? If we scale Q in such a way that this is one, this will correspond to the depth of our point. Very well. So we can start with this, and we can just initialize uh, our depth with one all over the place. So what we'll do now is um, we will actually find our uh, projections. So we can again set up a measurement matrix, but now our measurement matrix uh, will involve uh, points in homogeneous space. And uh, Ah, yeah, okay. You can see that, uh, sorry, this is not homogeneous space because we actually did this trick here with the lambda. We can always normalize this to one. So we essentially pull out the, the depth or the, the set coordinate of our, um, of our projective model. We pull it out into this lambda. And then, of course, uh, we can find uh, Q11 and so on. So. Um, in this way as described up here. So uh, these are again our, where, where do we have that? Uh, these, are, these are essentially just the multiplication of uh, lambda ij and xij and this point over here, which will give us our q11 and so on. And then on the right hand side, you will find those projection matrices. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. Ah, okay. So this is really the homogeneous vector Q. So we have the homogeneous vector Q in here. We pulled out the lambda uh, and the lambda, and uh, here we have on the right hand side the projection matrices and the world points and homogeneous coordinates. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, everything is, everything is homogeneous here, but you typically, once you have the observation on your screen, you don't know the depth, right? You don't know the homogeneous coordinate. This is why you scale it to one, and then you pull out the lambda because you don't know what was, what's happening with the lambda during the projection. And you assume in the first iteration it's just going to be one. And again, uh, we use uh, this trick with a registered measurement matrix and uh, we assume that this depth is known. Then if we do that, we can show that this also uh, will give us a registered measurement matrix of rank four, and um, then we can use SVD to decompose it, and once we do that, we can actually use U and sigma and we transpose to have an initialization that will give us a first decomposition. So, here we can then reconstruct the projection matrices from U, uh, initialization from the projection matrices from U sigma, and from V transpose will be the initialization of our, um, of our seam points. So the thing that we will do is now we will iterate this, and we will start with an initialization of um, lambda uh, to be equal to one. Then uh, we scale the measurement matrix such that all the column and row vectors have a norm of one. Then we enforce our rank criterion, and then we use SVD to estimate the projection matrices in the 3D structure. And then we reproject the estimated points and update. You will realize that uh, we now have to update the lambda ij's. And uh, we can repeat that uh, if we have a significant change in the projective depth. And doing so, we iterate in order to get our uh, 3D reconstruction of points. Okay, yeah, so we don't go into detail too much about this algorithm and it's not gonna be part of the uh, exam in any way. Yeah? So the, the perspective case won't be part. It's just to show you that we can use a couple of tricks and then iterate back and forth. And with this, we will be able also to use it in the perspective case. Very well, if you are interested in this topic, then of course, um, you can have a look at the paper by Tomasi and Kanade. Uh, the factorization method, which was published in 92, and um, also at different variants. So you see, this is something that's typically done. So you use the orthographic case, then you expand it to the paraperspective case, and uh, in the end, you can derive a perspective factorization method. And this was actually um, published in 2002, but uh, Peter Sturm already found a solution for this algorithm uh, in 1996. So this is also something that happens every now and then in science that people are not aware of a certain publication and then very similar or almost the same methods get published twice. Okay, yes, questions? Well, it seems that sometimes the referees uh, make mistakes, but this was published on ECCB, so this is actually a, a high-impact conference. So they should have been aware of it, but um, yeah, and this is also Journal of uh, Visualization and Computer Animation, so maybe a different community, more in visualization and computer animation, and they sometimes are not aware of what is happening in the computer vision community. But actually, uh, Tomasi and Kanade were very well known in computer vision. Yeah. Just happens. Okay, by, uh, by the way, there's much more famous examples than uh, this factorization method. Uh, you, you, know, you know the Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse, right? And uh, Moore and Penrose published it uh, independently and I think they were not only a couple of years apart, but actually decades. Um, so <laughs> maybe if you, if you manage to publish it again, it will be the Moore-Penrose uh, Davari pseudo-inverse. <laughs> 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 
Yes, more questions? Yes, please. So we are talking about a, a camera system. Not, so we are talking about the tracking of the marker. And once we have the 3D position of the marker, then we can also, we know how to realign our ultrasound slices. Yeah, that's, that's the trick, that you do a handheld camera and you track the actual pose of the ultrasound probe. And with that information, you can reconstruct the 3D volume. It's an obvious application of factorization. Any more questions? If that's not the case, then I wish you a good evening and see you on Thursday. <laughs>